Well, the areas I plan to discuss today are first, I'm going to start by talking about the importance of pre harvest handling or pre slaughter handling. The areas I'm going to zero in on are transport losses and market weight pigs, carcass bruising and trim loss, pork quality defects, and the economic implications of pre harvest handling. Next, I'll talk about predisposing factors for transport losses. And I'm going to close by talking about what you specifically can do during loading and transportation to minimize stress and to minimize transport losses. So when we look at pre-harvest handling, I think it almost goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. Humane handling is the right thing to do, and it's the responsibility of every handler to ensure that all pigs are handled and transported in a humane manner. As we look at pre-harvest handling, it has important implications for animal well-being and economics. More specifically, pig handling and transportation methods can impact transport losses at the packing plant, carcass bruising and trim loss, and fresh pork quality traits. So we'll now dial in on these three topics and discuss them in more detail. I'm going to start by talking about transport losses and market weight pigs. And before I get get into this, I want to start by defining transport losses to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. A dead on arrival or a DOA refers to a pig that died during transportation. A dead in yard or dead in pen refers to a pig that died after unloading at the packing plant. And this is usually going to occur in the larage pen. Non-ambulatory pigs refer to pigs that are unable to move or keep up with the rest of the group at the packing plant. So depending upon which packers you work with, the terms may vary, but common terms in the industry would include subjects, slows, suspects, cripples, and stressors. Just keep in mind those are all interchangeable terms for non-ambulatory pigs. And lastly, when I use the phrase transport losses, I'm simply referring to the sum of dead and non-ambulatory pigs at the packing plant. Now, when I was in graduate school at the University of Illinois, we conducted several field studies to determine the causes of dead and non-ambulatory pigs. And in these studies, we observed two types of non-ambulatory pigs. So on the left, we'd, we'd have what we call a fatigue pig. So in layman's terms, this is a pig unable to move or keep up with the rest of the group that's exhibiting physical signs of stress. On the right, we have what we'd call an injured pig. So this is a pig that has a compromised ability to move due to lameness or due to an injury sustained during the marketing process. And in our field studies, we saw that the vast majority of these non-ambulatory pigs were classified as fatigued. So now I'm going to take just a few moments to describe the fatigue pig syndrome in more detail. So what we found through controlled research studies is that these fatigue pigs display signs of acute stress or, in other words, short-term stress. So they exhibit open mouth breathing, or in other words, panting. Uh, we can see skin discoloration on our white pigs, where in this picture up here in the right-hand corner, we can see that reddish-purple blotching of the skin. In some cases, we may hear abnormal vocalizations, which for lack of a better description, I would describe as a barking noise. And we may even see some animals with muscle tremors in which they begin shaking. Metabolically, these pigs are in a metabolic state of acidosis. So Elanco has done controlled research where we've taken fatigue pigs from a load and matched that with the normal pig from the same load. And what we found is that the fatigue pigs have three times higher blood lactic acid values than their normal counterparts. So what does that mean? Well, what, the buildup of lactic acid in muscle is believed to be associated with the onset of muscle fatigue and the burning and cramping sensation that you feel during intense exercise, like running a 100-meter dash. So as that acid builds up in the blood, we're also going to see a subsequent drop in blood pH. Additionally, in some studies, we've seen that fatigued pigs have elevated body temperatures. We've got some anecdotal data from the summer uh, where we've uh, tempt fatigue pigs, and we've seen that the rectal temperatures of fatigue pigs can range from 105 to 109 degrees Fahrenheit. There's two things that we need to keep in mind there. The resting temperature of a finishing pig is about 102.5. Secondly, heat stress-related deaths have been reported to occur around 109 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we get to the upper end of that temperature spectrum, there's a chance that we could lose some pigs to heat stress. The question becomes, can those pigs recover? Interestingly, though, when we've done our controlled studies and we've had pigs that become, have become fatigued and we've removed them from the stressful situation and put them in a recovery pen, 
the vast majority of those pigs will, in fact, recover with two to three hours of rest. Now, some of you in the audience may be saying, wow, this sounds very similar to the stress gene or porcine stress syndrome with those signs of stress and those metabolic conditions. Is this simply the stress gene popping back up in the U.S. pig population? So when I was in graduate school, we conducted a large commercial survey. We went to four Midwestern packing plants. We collected DNA from 600 dead pigs, approximately 600 fatigued pigs, and approximately 600 normal pigs. And what we found was 98% of these fatigued pigs at the packing plants that we evaluated were free for the stress gene. So that basically says the, the porcine stress syndrome has been eliminated from the U.S. pig population, and it's having minimal effects on the fatigue pig condition that we're seeing today. Now, as we look at the incidence of transport losses at U.S. packing plants, dead pigs at the packing plant are reported to USDA FSIS, and that information is available via the Freedom of Information Act. So we now have a 20-year history of dead pigs at the packing plant. So at the bottom of this graph, we have the calendar years of 1991 all the way to 2010 and the percentage of dead pigs on the y-axis. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly here. Uh, but the key points I want, want you to take from this is in the early 1990s, the dead rate was very low, being around 0.07 to 0.08 percent. We then saw a three-fold increase uh, from 1993 to 1998, where we peaked at 0.3 percent. So in layman's terms, that's a half pig per semi-trailer load. If we think about that time in swine production, there were several changes to our production practices. One, we started to select for leaner, heavier muscled animals. Our slaughter weights increased, and our size of production operations increased. We then leveled off there for a four-year period. And in 2001, or excuse me, 2002, uh, the rate of dead pigs dropped to 0.22%. This has been attributed to greater industry awareness of the issue uh, through educational programs like the National Pork Board's TQA program. Additionally, there was a lot of research conducted in the late 90s and early 2000s on this topic. Uh, that yielded a lot of important information that was implemented into production systems. We then leveled off there for about a five-year period. That would suggest that little improvement was made over that time period when I think, in fact, the opposite was true. Packers started to euthanize pigs that they believed had a low likelihood of recovering, and those animals were then recorded as dead pigs. So the definition of a dead pig changed. And then here over the last four years, we have seen a slow but steady decline down to 0.17%. The key thing that I'll ask you to hold your questions till the end if we can. The key thing I'd like for you to take away from this is over the last four, 10 years, we've seen a 42% reduction in dead pigs at the packing plant. Now, as we look at the incidence of non-ambulatory pigs at the packing plant, unfortunately, national statistics are not available. So currently, our best estimate is commercial field trials. So we recently summarized all the commercial field trial data out there and in that data set, there's 23 commercial field trials representing 6.6 .6 million market hogs transported over the years of 2000 to 2007. What we found in this data set was the, the weighted average for dead pigs was 0.25%. The rate of non-ambulatory pigs was 0.44%. And we look at total transport losses being the combination of dead and non-ambulatory pigs. That number was 0.69%. So what that means in layman's terms, we would expect one pig per load to die or become non-ambulatory at the packing plant. I'm now going to shift gears and talk about carcass bruising and trim loss. I apologize, these pictures may be difficult to see in the back, but what you can see on these pictures here is bruising within these cuts of meat. And what happens is when we have a bruise in a cut of meat, the packer is required to trim that bruise, and there's economic losses associated with that that are termed trim loss. When we review the literature and look at the work that's been done in this area, it's been well established that carcass bruising can be increased by rough handling at the farm, poorly maintained facilities where we may have sharp or protruding objects in the barn, overcrowding pigs during transport, as well as fighting. So when those pigs fight, there's going to be scratches and potentially bruisings, bruised, bruises that could occur during transportation or during larage at the packing plant. Another area that pre-harvest handling can impact is fresh pork quality traits. So here in the middle, we have our, our normal or our ideal pork. It has a red, cherry red, bright cherry red color, a firm texture, and a high water holding capacity. On the left here, we have what we'd call PSE pork, or pale soft and exudative pork. It has a very pale color, 
a soft and floppy texture, and a poor water holding capacity. On the extreme opposite, we have what we call dark, firm, and dry pork. This has a dark purple color, a very firm texture, and a very high water holding capacity. So now I'm going to talk about how pre-slaughter stress can drive the outcome of those three classifications for pork quality. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what I want you to take away from this is when we have long-term stress, so we have adverse conditions at the farm, what that can, can cause then is dark, firm, and dry pork. So that animal's using up muscle energy stores at the farm. So when we harvest that animal, there's less muscle glycogen to convert to lactic acid, and we don't have the drop in pH. pH is associated with color and water holding capacity, so that's how we can get that condition up here. On the opposite end of the spectrum, when we have the stress gene or short-term stress where the animal endures stress immediately prior to harvest, what happens is that animal will have an elevated body temperature. It will increase all the rates of postmortem glycolysis, and we get a very rapid change in pH. And what that does is changes the structure of the protein so it can no longer hold water, and the color pigments found in meat then go with the subsequent fuel, uh, fluid loss. So just be aware that uh, pre-harvest stress can play an impact in the development of DFD and PSE pork. Now, as we look at the e now we'll look at the economic implications of pre-harvest handling. Some of this data is outdated, but I put it in here so you get a feel for how uh, adverse pre-harvest handling can impact the bottom line. I'll start with the review paper from 2009 where we reviewed transport losses and market weight pigs. In that paper, we used a number of 0.22% for dead pigs, assumed a total loss of value on those pigs, and it represented a cost of 28 cents per pig when applied to the U.S. commercial pig population. We look at non-ambulatory pigs, we used an incidence of 0.44% and assumed a 30% discount on those animals, and that translates to economic losses of 17 cents per pig. When we look at pork quality defects, the data is a little bit more sparse in this area. But when we look at some commercial surveys that were conducted through the pork quality chain audit, the frequency of carcass bruising was 6.5%. That translated to $0.08 cents per pig. The rate of PSE at that time in 2003 was 15.5%, and that translated to $0.90 cents per pig. And DFD was at a much lower rate of 1.9%, but there was no economic losses associated with that because that pork quality has a very high water holding capacity. So again, the data is outdated there, but I just wanted to give you a feel for what the economic impact could be. Now what I want to do is really zero in on transport losses and discuss what we know uh, with the research that's been conducted over the last 10 years. We know that transport losses are a multifactorial problem. In particular, we know that transport losses are impacted by the HAL 1843 mutation or the stress gene but if you recall from about the second slide, we've said that's basically been eliminated from the U.S. commercial pig population. We also know that handling methods, facility design, crowding pigs during transport, and extreme weather conditions can impact transport losses as well. And what I really want to zero in here is, in my opinion, of all those factors up there, handling methods has the biggest impact. So I want to discuss in detail what we know about proper pig handling. I'm going to start by talking about handling tool. This was a study conducted by Dr. John McGlone at Texas Tech University. And in this study, they moved pigs through a handling course with one tool. It was either a sorting board, an electric prod, or a plastic livestock paddle. And they recorded the amount of time it took to move from point A to point B. What they found in this study was using a sorting board significantly reduced the amount of time it took to complete the handling course. So what these authors concluded is that the sorting board is the single most effective handling tool when moving pigs. So therefore, we'd recommend that all handlers use a sorting board when moving pigs. Another factor that can have an impact is handling intensity. So in other words, how fast are we trying to load a truck? This was a study from Dr. Harold Ganyu at the Prairie Swine Center in Canada. And in this study, they moved pigs through a handling course with one of three methods. So it was aggressive handling with hot shots, so they were encouraging the pigs to move rapidly by using an electric prod. They had aggressive handling with paddles, so again, encouraging pigs to move rapidly, but this time by using a plastic paddle. And the third treatment was gentle handling with plastic paddles. So here, the pigs were allowed to move at a slow and calm pace, and the tool of choice was a plastic paddle. 
On the y-axis, we have the percentage of fatigued pigs. So not necessarily all of these pigs were unable to move. They, had, they also classified pigs with rectal temperature over X degrees as fatigued. But what they found here is when pigs were moved with aggressive handling with hot shots, 34% of the pigs were classified as fatigued using the definitions defined by the researchers. Now, if all they did was change the hot shot for an electric prod, or a hot shot for a plastic paddle, they saw a 19 percentage point reduction in fatigued pigs. To take it a step further, what you can see here, there's additional improvement to be made by allowing those pigs to move at a slow and calm pace. So what this data demonstrates is the negative effects of moving pigs rapidly with electric prods, but also highlights the importance of allowing those pigs to move at a slow and calm pace. Now, typically, when I show this slide, there's a lot of questions on, okay, we understand that aggressively handling pigs with hot shots is a problem. What about minimal electric prod use? Is there any data out there on that? To my knowledge, there's one study. When I was in graduate school, we did a very small study where we evaluated that. So in this study, we had 48 pigs we moved individually through a handling course. The handler used a sorting board and either encouraged the pigs to move with zero shocks, which was a plastic paddle, two shocks, or four shocks from an electric prod. Two key points in this study is, one, the pigs were allowed to move at their own pace, and two, we defined a shock as pushing the button and tapping the pig for the purposes of this study. Down below, we have a summary of our three handling treatments on body temperature and blood lactic acid values. And if you recall from the introduction, those are two parameters that are elevated in fatigued pigs, so we can use these as indicators of physical stress. What we found in this study is when pigs were moved with four shocks, they had significantly higher body temperatures and blood lactic acid values than pigs moved with a plastic paddle. Additionally, what we found is when pigs were moved with two shocks, they did not differ from the pigs on the zero shock treatment for body temperature or blood lactic acid values. So what this one small study would suggest is if we can move pigs from barn pen to trailer compartment with two shocks or less, we can minimize stress during the loading process. Another factor that can have an impact is group size during loading. So in other words, how many pigs is the handler taking from the pen to the truck? This was a study that we collaborated with Cargill on where we went to a commercial finishing facility and we said this side of the aisle, we're gonna load those pigs in groups of four. This side of the aisle, we're gonna load those pigs in groups of eight and we're gonna compare them on the same trailer loaded by the same crew going to the same packing plant. So in this, this graph here, the red bars are going to represent the pigs loaded in groups of four. The blue bars are going to represent the pigs loaded in groups of eight. And what we found in this study is when we reduced group size during loading from eight to four, we significantly reduced the percentage of dead pigs at the packing plant, the percentage of non-ambulatory pigs at the packing plant, and we reduced overall total transport losses by 56%. Additionally, when we typically talk group size with load crews and transporters, we get the pushback of, well, if we load in groups of four, we're going to double our load time. We measured load time in this study, and what do you think happened? It actually took significantly less time to load pigs in groups of four than it did in groups of eight. So the really th the, what I really like about this study is this is something that everybody in this room can go home and do tonight and it's not going to cost you anything, and you're going to see immediate results. Um, so I think it's a very impactful study uh, that it's something I want you to take away from today's presentation. Now, if we summarize what we've learned over the last 10 years on specifically pig handling, we've learned that the single most effective tool is the sorting board. We've also learned that stress responses are minimized when we allow pigs to move at a slow and calm pace, when we move pigs in small groups, and we move pigs with plastic paddles or less than or equal to two shocks. As I mentioned, handling, in my opinion, is the most important factor, but this is a multifactorial problem, and there are other factors that can come into play. One such factor is facility design. So we collaborated with Dr. Anna Johnson at Iowa State University in a large production system to evaluate facility design. We were hearing a lot of good things in the industry around if you lose, use large pins with pre-sorting capabilities, you can significantly reduce dead pigs at the packing plant. But to our knowledge, there was not any controlled studies that had been conducted on that area. So we did a study. We went into a large commercial finishing facility that had uh, swinging gates in the back of the pins. One side of the aisle, we had small pins at 32, where the marked pigs were pre-sorted, or excuse me, were not pre-sorted. 
They were, lo- they were sorted at the time of loading. The other side of the aisle, we opened up those swinging gates to make larger pins. So we made pins of 192, and then the day before loading, we utilized those internal gates to pre-sort the marked pigs from the unmarked pigs to facilitate loading the next day. So in this graph here, we've got the percentage of pigs transported. The red bars represent pigs loaded from pins of 32 that were sorted out of the pin at the time of loading. The blue bars represent those raised in pins of 192 that were manually pre-sorted from unmarked pigs the day before loading. What we found was using large pins and pre-sorting significantly reduced dead pigs at the packing plant, non-ambulatory pigs at the packing plant, and reduced overall total transport losses at the packing plant by 66%. Now we've got some additional work to do in this area. We ran a confounded study to look at two different systems. We don't know of that 66% improvement, what of that is attributed to raising pigs in larger pens versus what is due to pre-sorting. So those are some additional questions that remain out there today. Another factor that can have an impact is transport floor space, or in other words, how many pigs are we putting on the trailer? So this was a study I did in graduate school where we loaded 42 pigs, 42 trailer loads of pigs, and within each trailer, we compared six floor space treatments ranging from 4.26 to 5.6 square feet per pig for pigs weighing 282 pounds. So when we put that on a 53-foot straight deck trailer with an internal loading ramp, that corresponds to load sizes of 188 down to 144 pigs per load. So each one of these treatments would have varied by one pig uh, per compartment. What we found in this study, the blue bars would represent percent dead, maroon or percent fatigued, yellow or percent injured. What we found is floor space has a major impact on transport losses at the packing plant. And in general, those losses are minimized when we provide heavyweight pigs with at least five square feet per pig. If we look at our current industry recommendations, a lot of those recommendations read we should provide 4.26 uh, to 4.79 square feet per pig. So this may be an opportunity if we're struggling with transport losses uh, to reduce some additional losses. Another factor that can come into play is seasonal variation or extreme weather conditions. This was some data that was presented by Chris Rademacher at the Allen Lehman Swain Conference a few years ago uh, from the production system he was working in. Down at the bottom of the graph, we have the months of January to December and the percentage of transport losses on the y-axis. As we look at this blue line, which represents percentage of dead pigs at the packing plant, as you would expect, we see dead pigs spike during the July-August time period. Now, as we look at the red line, we see something drastically different. This represents the percentage of non-ambulatory pigs at the packing plant. And here, we found that non-ambulatory pigs are actually the lowest from April to August and then spike during this late fall, early winter time period. So that creates the question is, is that summer heat enough to put a fatigued pig over the edge and result in death? Or are we actually experiencing more transport losses during that late fall, early winter time period? The answer to that question lies in the green line, which is where we've combined dead and non-ambulatory pigs. And what we see there in that green line is if we look, actually total transport losses are the highest for the year during the October to December time period. Now, the million-dollar question is why is that happening? And I have to be honest with you, we don't have any black and white or concrete answers around that, and I don't have time to speculate on that. But what I do know is those seasonal trends are very consistent across production systems in the Midwest, and we've got to create the awareness around it and devote some time to research the issue to understand it better. Now what I want to close on is talking about specifically what you can do at the farm during loading and during transportation to reduce these losses under commercial conditions. The first thing we can do is better prepare pigs for transport. One thing we can do is walk pins daily. So by walking pins daily, we're getting pigs familiar with humans, so when we go to load those pigs out, they're not uh, piling up in the corners. Additionally, it's allowing us an opportunity to identify and treat sick pigs. Another thing we could do is routinely move pigs prior to loading. We did a proof of concept study a couple years ago in North Carolina where we went into a finishing barn the day before loadout. And what we did is we took one side of the aisle, we moved them out of the barn to an outside loadout corral, returned them to their pen. The other side of the aisle, we did nothing. We came back the next day, loaded out those two groups, and what we found was moving pigs one time reduced loading time, signs of stress during loading, and transport losses at the packing plant. 
And I'll be the first to admit that's not the most practicable strategy to implement under commercial conditions. But it does prove the concept that it will work. So what we've got to challenge ourselves with is how can we achieve that result without having to do all that work. And I think what we need to think about is if we open pins and allow pigs to roam the aisle during the day, can we achieve a fraction of that result? Another thing is I talked about pre-sorting pigs prior to loading is another opportunity. If we sort those pigs from pin mates, allow them an opportunity to fully rest and recover, and we don't have to sort them at the time of loading, we've definitely allowed that pig an opportunity to rest and recover. So there's definitely advantages to that. The challenge we have is not all of our barns today are equipped with the large pins and the pre-sorting capabilities. Uh, so there's limitations to that one. The last one, we've done a couple of studies. Where one where we've looked at withdrawing feed for 16 hours prior to loading, and another one where we've withdrawn feed for 24 hours prior to loading, and we've seen some numerical reductions in transport losses. Now what we have to keep in mind there is this is difficult to implement under commercial conditions. If we've got large pins and we can pre-sort marked pigs from unmarked pigs, it's very easy and we should be doing it. But if we've got a traditional finisher design where we're taking multiple cuts out of that barn, we don't want to be subjecting pigs to multiple out of feed events as that can result in some decreased performance and some adverse health effects. But that's something there to be aware of that it can have a positive impact. The other thing we can do is to minimize stress. So just to hit the key points from what we talked about earlier, we want to minimize the use of electric prods during loading. We have one study that says if we can uh, load pigs with two shocks or less, we can minimize stress. The key point there is it's two shocks or less from barn pin to trailer compartment. We want to move pigs in groups of four to six at a slow and calm pace. Every barn has different aisle widths and pigs of varying sizes. So as a general rule of thumb, we need to be able to reach that lead pig and be able to be in control of that group. Ideally, we'd like to minimize the distance pigs are moved during loading, but if we have facilities where a loading chute's located at one end of the building, that may not be feasible. So under those circumstances, what we'd recommend to do is take those pigs from the front of the barn, load them onto the top deck of the trailer, and those that have to walk from the back of the barn, let's put them on the bottom deck of the trailer so they don't have to experience the additional stressor of climbing the loading ramp. The other thing <coughs> excuse me, that we want to do is we want to monitor pigs during the loading process and watch for any pigs having difficulties walking. If you recall from the introduction, we've seen that the majority of these fatigued pigs will recover. So let's identify them when we first see signs of stress. Let's place those pigs in a recovery pen and allow them an opportunity to rest and recover uh, versus loading those pigs onto the trailer. And lastly, based off the transport floor space data I shared with you, we'd recommend using transport loading densities that do not exceed 58 pounds per square foot. And that terminology may look a little bit different to you, 58 pounds per square foot. We've got a calculator that will translate your trailer compartments, your weights, and number of pigs into the trailer that can assist you with those calculations. So to summarize what we've talked about here today, pre-harvest handling has important implications for animal well-being and economics, as improper handling can result in transport losses, carcass bruising, and poor quality defects. As we look at transport losses and market weight pigs, approximately 0.7% of all pigs transported die or become non-ambulatory at the packing plant. Now, another way to look at that is over 99% of the market hogs that we transport in the U.S. walk off the trailer and walk through the packing plant without any physical problems. And if we think about that, regardless of industry that you're in, if you're doing something right, over 99% of the time, you're doing a pretty good job. But what we've got to keep in mind here is this is an animal welfare issue. Our critics are going to say one is too many. So although our numbers are low, we've got to continue to strive to get better. As we talked about, transport losses are a multifactorial problem. And we know that they can be impacted by the stress gene, which has basically been eliminated from the U.S. pig population, handling methods, facility design, crowding pigs during transport, and extreme weather conditions. So based on the data I shared with you, you need to be aware of Extremely hot conditions can be problematic, but also extremely cold conditions that late fall, early time winter, or early fall, late winter, er, excuse me, late fall, early winter time period can present some problems to us. And lastly, transport losses can be minimized by better preparing pigs for transport, as well as minimizing stress throughout the marketing process from loading at the farm all the way up to stunning at the packing plant. So before I close, I want to make you aware that we do put out a monthly or quarterly 
uh, newsletter where we do share tips and, and uh, the latest and greatest on research and pig handling and transportation. And that's a free newsletter that can be signed up for by going to www.hoghandlingupdate.com.